Um, I just wanted to again share just a little bit about CAPCO. So as I mentioned, the work that we do, um, we're excited to be a headline sponsor here today. Um, but also the reason that we support BYP is because we're aligned in our vision and mission around supporting black professionals, specifically emerging talent. Um, for all the reasons that Kike mentioned, it's really important the concept of community, uh, the value of relationships and networks, and that's how you grow your career. Um, when I started my DEI, my first DEI role, I remember um, one of my mentors telling a story about a senior leader at a firm who went to go speak to a women's network, and he talked all about how his job had come from people that he knew, and he said, this guy called me when he moved to this bank, and this guy called me, and it's like, dude, did you read the room? Because that doesn't happen for everyone, right? His profile of person, that, per that type of thing happened for him often, but for people who didn't look like him, didn't share that same identity, it wasn't a thing. So by supporting BYP and supporting and building a community where people who look like us, you can make connections. And if you don't get a job today, you make a connection that can lead you to your next opportunity. And growth isn't always about a new job, right? It's about expanding your network, expanding your skill set. It's about just growing. So we're really excited um, to support BYP and launching here um, in the US and really excited to have you all in the room. We'll have an excellent lineup of events uh, today, including a panel of uh, my esteemed colleagues at CAPCO, um, but then also just really a rock star lineup of speakers, really, really excited for people to drop gems. I shared on LinkedIn that I wasn't sure if I was excited about the welcome or the speakers, or I didn't know what I was gonna be most excited about, but hopefully you all will stick around for happy hour later and we can share um, what our most exciting moments were for the day. Um, please feel free to stop by the CAPCO table. Um, in addition to learning about our firm, you can absolutely grab a lip balm or a sticker if that's your thing, um, but we really want just make connections. Um, let's use this opportunity also to connect on LinkedIn. Again, leave here with more connections than you came, right? Sound like a plan? Okay, I should. I'm going to leave you to it. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> I was going to say another thing um, that I should have led with, Kike, is that I am 100% extrovert, and I should have led with that. And um, as when I walked in today, I, I said that I was going to be quiet, but I never am. So when I say, "Are y'all ready?" I need y'all to be a little bit more enthusiastic with the yes. So are y'all ready? Yeah. There we go. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, so with that, I want to bring my colleagues to the stage. Um, you'll hear more about our Be Yourself at Work culture that I mentioned just a little bit ago through them, um, but I'd like to bring them to the stage for a conversation around changing the black narrative, um, creating space to be yourself at work. CAPCO is, is founded on our Be Yourself at Work culture, and it's what drives the work that I do every day. Um, but we recognize that advancing your career and growing your career um, requires that you need to stretch yourself, stretch your limits, and they're going to talk about that and what happens at the intersection of authenticity, um, the, the intersection of authenticity and um, identity in your career. So with that, if I could get my colleagues to join the stage. So Aruka Brown is a managing principal um, at CAPCO in our New York office. Uh, Nisa Askia is our marketing manager and founder of our uh, Black Employee Resource Group in the U.S., Black at CAPCO. Trevor Williams is a partner in New York, and Randall Sawyer is also a partner, formerly of New York, based in Chicago. With that, I will turn it over to y'all. Thank you, thank you, Dee. Good afternoon, everyone. So, so happy to be here with all of you, and I will say especially with my dear colleagues, these are people that I know, that I work with, not just folks that, you know, I'm just sharing the stage with today. Um, I will, would like to allow each of them to give an introduction. My name is Aruka Brown. Uh, Dee just introduced me briefly. I would say of those on the stage, I'm the career consultant so far. I uh, have been in this business for over 15 years. Uh, and you know, I'm excited uh, to continue the conversation and learning more about our panelists today. So Nisa. Hi, everybody. My name is Nisa Skia. Um, I'm a marketing manager for Capco. I've been at Capco for about five years, and I'm also the founder of our Black Affinity Group, Black at Capco, and very, very happy to be here. And I'm Trevor Williams. I'm a partner here at Capco. I run our capital markets business for the U.S. I'm also responsible for coaching for the U.S. as well. I've been here for three years, but spent 20 plus years in financial services in a variety of roles, and super excited to be here. Yeah. And uh, I'm Randall Sawyer, a client partner also at Capco. Uh, I've been with Capco for five years now, I believe. I uh, spent the better part of the last 20 years working with some of the largest financial institutions 
in the world, including Morgan Stanley and Barclays. Um, and I'm very happy to be here because I live in Chicago now, and I spent most of my time in New York and London, and I don't get to see these beautiful faces all the time, not through a Teams. So I'm very happy to engage with you guys today. So let's start the conversation. So uh, hashtag be yourself at work is a real hashtag at CAFCO. It's a real moniker. It's something that we actually uh, say and, and believe. Um, we want to talk about here uh, how you can be yourself at work but while stretching, right? Knowledge is power is the theme of this afternoon. So I want to start with um, some que a question for, for Trevor initially. We're very, uh, you know, easygoing people. So this is going to be conversational, but we are organized as well. So I do, <laughs> I want to start with Trevor. So Trevor, tell me, um, how do you show your authenticity uh, as a minority while also being successful? So that is a great question. Um, I think I'll start by saying, you know, doing your work with mastery in this day and age, it's like table stakes. Like, like that's the minimum uh, requirement to be successful. But it's critically important that you actually connect with your coworkers because as humans, we all want to see ourselves reflected in the people that we spend time with. Um, and you'll find when you don't and you allow distance to be created with your coworkers, a lot of times that promotion you thought you deserved, you don't get, or the project that you want to be on, you don't have an opportunity to work on. And to me, part of being successful, and one thing I learned pretty early on in my career, and how I was effectively able to navigate that, because it is critically important for you to be authentic in your attempt, because the reality is, if you're not, you know, people will see that, and they won't believe you, and then you feel like you sacrificed for nothing. Um, so to me, what I cleave to is company culture, right? If you embody the company culture and you use that as a springboard to share of yourself, then you create a safe space for people to kind of get to know you and then you can sort of radiate out from there. Right? And a good example, just this week, I was speaking with one of the folks at work. And at Capco, we have a entrepreneurial spirit. Right? It's one of the things that we're known for, we're very proud of it. And I was just explaining to this gentleman that, you know, I got my first job when I was 12 delivering newspapers. I used to deliver the daily news, get up at 5 o'clock before school in junior high school and deliver the newspapers. But then I further shared the reason that I wanted that job is because there was a, a young lady that I wanted to impress. There we go. There we go. And back in the day, <laughs> you know, uh, people used to wear, uh, we call them felines, but felines, right? And there's a pair of black suede felines that were $79.99. And when I didn't have any money for that, so got my little paper route so I could get those shoes. And just to connect it to today, still wearing my suede shoes. <laughs> right. So let's go. Right. There we go. Our sneaker game. I love it. I mean, one other thing you, you have to touch upon is that having a diverse perspective is a competitive advantage for all of these businesses. How many times have we seen missteps? in businesses where they've gone out and marketed something that was completely tone deaf, right? So you gotta understand that your perspective matters. Like, you're not just there as an only, like get involved in the business, get involved in the conversations. Um, and you know, I think that'll, that'll make you feel more a part of the company culture and attached to the people that you work with. You want to add anything to that one? Yeah, no, I just, what Randy just mentioned about like certain things that go out that can be tone deaf. I'm on a marketing team and you know, you see different visuals of us and it's like when you see certain things, you're like, did you run that by anybody black in your, in your company? And it's like certain things that I just see because I inherently am a black person, so therefore I notice certain things. So it matters to have people there and to have people looking at these things. And it sounds so minute, but it's extremely important because then you know, you're apologizing and putting out the tweets and doing all of that stuff after the fact when if there was representation there and people who felt okay to speak up about certain things, you could stop it before it happened. So. I want to expand a little bit on the company culture 
uh, aspect, um, Trevor and Randy, you talked about that. That implies that you know a little bit about the company culture before you join. Obviously, we, we don't know everything about a company before we join a company, but how does one, um, you know, consider company culture in the process of seeking a job and calibrating that against your own personality in order to be authentic? Do you have some thoughts on that? I mean, yeah, I can start. Uh, you I mean, one of the first ones is if, if you're even close to the interview process or know someone within the company, that interview is not only them interviewing you, but you interviewing the company. Um, you've got to understand and ask them questions about things that matter to you. You know, ask them, you know, what are some of the key things that they think would make someone successful in that business? And then align that to whether you think that will let you feel authentic. Um, you know, at times it will, at times it won't. Another thing you can look at is the pillars and values that people live by. I'll always say the values of a company are things that they're striving to get to, not necessarily things that are there now. Um, but looking at those, you'll be able to truly sort of assess where they are sort of in their journey towards, in my view, being inclusive for people like me. Now, that's a great point, actually, and you did actually steal my thunder because I was going to say the literal same thing. But the one thing I will add is, <laughs> the one thing I will add is, I think it's also important to have those conversations, um, not just because you're interviewing. And the conversations I'm specifically talking about is, everywhere that you want to work, you probably want to network your way in and not just sort of read the company website, et cetera, et cetera, simply because there are also a number of unspoken rules at every organization. And you can kind of um, get a little bit of insight into your experience more than what is just said on the website. So that's one thing I would have had. Okay. Um, Nisa, you mentioned your marketing. Uh, we're a consulting firm. This is a transition for you, I understand. Yeah. From the, so I, can you tell us how you transitioned into, into consulting? Sure, sure. Um, <laughs> so I went to college. Uh, thought I knew what I wanted to do. I uh, majored in sociology, women's studies, and a minor in psychology, right? So I'm like, okay, I'm going, you know, I'm going to do sociology. I'm going to be a social worker or something. <laughs> and I just knew that's what I was going to do. And then I graduated, went into a nonprofit, and um, I would help with board materials as we got things done. And I started to, like, design things, the PowerPoints, the little tags here, the flyer there. And I realized when I was doing that, time flew by. Mm -hmm. Like I was just hyper-focused and I was into it and I loved it. But at that point, you know, we would already graduated college and sent my mom the diploma. She got it, you know, she got it posted up and I'm like, oh man, like I invested a lot, student loans, everything. Now I can't, what can I do? But the thing was, I, I have a mentor who would always tell me life is not a dress rehearsal. So um, this was my life and I needed to do something about it. And I said, you know what, YOLO. <laughs> like I'm gonna bank on myself and it was terrifying, it was scary. But what I did was I used my like basic talents and I went on to School of Visual Arts here in New York and um, studied courses. And one thing that I did that I really do wanna share with people is I would do volunteer work in design. And it was building my portfolio, but also nurturing that sociology, that, that care about people, that nonprofit spirit, because I would volunteer for nonprofits and do some of their materials, but it also was giving me experience. Um, and it, it just is, it was a wing and a prayer and faith in myself. And that didn't mean it wasn't days that I was like, oh no, I made a bad choice. <laughs> like, I don't know about this, but I knew that I felt really, really good doing designing work. I felt really good with visuals. And then come to find out, my mom was like, you know, you've always been like this. You've always been creative. You always used to say you wanted to be a fashion designer when you grew up. So it was just, it was taking a purposeful pivot, you know, and it took about a year before I got into Capco and been there ever since. But it was really that, that feeling of knowing that this is my life. And yes, I didn't see many people, black people in design in my visuals and where I saw it, but okay, I'll go do it. And it was really a leap of faith, but I'll tell more about all the other stuff that happened once I got to Capco. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, but okay, so you, you had that leap of faith to, to do it and make that decision. Yeah. How did you make it real? How did you make How it did happen? I make it? It, was, it was literally boots on the ground. The first thing that I did was the person who would come to the nonprofit and um, show presentations and different things, he was a designer, so he was the one that would do a lot of the marketing for them. The first thing I did was um, I called him up and I said, you know, just really quickly, I said, I'm not going to take up your time right now, but could we set up some time to just talk about some things because I'm really thinking about getting into this. And he was kind enough to do so. You know, what, all he could say was no, but he didn't. And he just told me certain steps. And it was really basic things that I was asking. What softwares? What are the programs that I should know? You know, what courses did you take when you went to school? So it was really basically asking someone who was in the industry that I didn't know very well, but was a pay it forward kind of person. So that was where I started. And that's where then the courses came and all of those other things that came. People are more generous than you, than you think they'll yeah. be, right? Yes. Yeah. Nice. yeah. Um, so generosity, goodwill, huh? but then the reality of the ups and downs, ebbs and flows of the macro environment. So let's, let's go a little. Uh -oh. You know, get a little, a little scared. Yeah. Right. Um, this is for all of you. Okay. So, how do you navigate challenging times? How do you navigate um, difficult climates? We're in one right now, recession talk, you know, layoffs, things like that. How does one um, deal with that as they're trying to still build a career and be positive? Who wants to take it first? I don't want to steal Trevor's thunder. <laughs> <laughs> okay, All right, so Trevor. I can start. So to me, in life, there's really only one way to be. And the reality is the only way is forward. So the challenge ends up being in a tough environment. Um, sometimes you dwell on challenges. And the reality is, unless that's helpful to you, there's really no benefit in doing it. So the way I always approach things is that at the end of the day, you always do your best, and you have to keep in mind, even when you're unhappy or happy or sad or whatever the case may be, you always start the new thing the way you finish the last thing. So you never take your foot off the gas because reality is it'll taint your efforts going forward. All right. I like that one. I got it. All right. So <laughs> I always put this in the back of my head. Never waste a good recession. So when things are down, there are opportunities for you to grow your portfolio, for you to grow the knowledge that you have, for you to invest in yourself, for you to invest in the community around you. Find the opportunity that you think is going to be there on that upswing, and you catch it when it's priced low all the time. You know, in a recessionary environment, people tend to start to panic, right? A lot of it's driven by fear. And whether it's you looking for a job, you gotta bring it back to the one thing it is that you're trying to do as opposed to looking at everything on a macro level. You need one job. You can go find one job. You don't need a million, right? We may need to add a million to the economy. But that one job that you're looking for, you can go out there, you can network, you can hustle, you can make those connections, and you can go find that one job you know, for you to be able to stay employed. But definitely invest in other things on the side, because that's the way that you're going to build wealth. Nisa, you want to add to that? Yeah, and I'll, I'll add to it in a more like uh, basic keep my soul alive kind of way. <laughs> um, when, like in 2020, and when everything was like, OK, everybody leaving the office, we, we, we heading home. Um, and we all were like, it'll be a month. Um, I remember one of the first things that I did was uh, started taking virtual courses. Now, it was like, all right, whatever this is, when I come out on the other end, I want something to show for it. Um, I bought a guitar and I took virtual courses. Like, and it was different things like on diversity, equity, inclusion. I wanted, to, I wanted to beef up on that. I didn't take it just because I'm black, I know everything. So I went into taking courses of that. I took some more design courses. It was things so I felt like I was putting one foot in front of the other and I wasn't taking my foot off the gas. And it actually was extremely helpful to me. And I also did things like I took a, a virtual soca dance course. It's like we forget about those things that bring us joy that can then transfer into us even 
caring to pursue our ambitions and things like that. So it's like in a very basic way, I did things to keep my spirit alive. And I do that from time to time. Even when things are fine, some days they're not fine. And I'll, I'll touch back to those certain things that would make me feel like me. Okay, so let's, let's go a little deeper into a couple of things I just heard y'all say. So you just talked about keeping your spirit alive. Randy talked about fear. In the context of uh, not just recessions, but I would posit consulting in general, uh, how do we, how, what, do you, what are some thoughts you have on managing your emotions, managing the ebbs and flows and the externalities that you can't control? How do you manage what's going on internally in the face of what's going on externally in consulting as a consultant? Ooh, I don't want to stay your thunder now. Mine? <laughs> but I can start it if you I want keep, me to. I don't know. I keep thinking of, uh, was it Mike Tyson that said, you never know how you're going to react until you get punched in the face? Oh. <laughs> oh. Right? So, you know, in any situation in consulting, it's always changing. You could have a client not want to do the things they wanted to do before. They may completely pull projects. Things are always changing. But you've got to stay even keeled, right? You have to take a couple moments and say, you know, holy crap, that just happened. But then bring it back and figure out how you're going to pivot from it, right? <laughs> like in consulting, we say it a lot, you have to fail fast. So like figure out what it is you could do to try to rectify the situation. Assess it really quick. If it doesn't work, I call Trevor, we talk about it, and then we come up with another <laughs> solution, right? So you just got to be, you know, resilient and keep going after it and fail fast. I mean, for me, so you may not be able to tell, but growing up, I had the worst temper, like the <laughs> absolute worst temper. I would just go off, you know, fly off the handle all the time. And the thing that I learned, which is underscored in what you were saying, is a lot of times something happens, and then you react, and there's an outcome. But when something happens, you pause, you think about your desired outcome, and you tailor your actions accordingly. It took me like so... I mean, literally decades of practice to get to where I am today, but that is of critical importance, um, you know, and, and how you govern yourself at work. Governing yourself, that's very interesting. I like the way you put that. Um, what else would you say are, are important attributes? Um, I have another one. And qualities in consulting. Well, go ahead. So the first one I'm gonna say is everybody say, I am good enough. That's right. I, I am, am good enough. Hard enough. Because you're gonna tell yourself all the time, I'm not qualified for this job. I don't know how to do this. I don't know why they asked me to do it, you know. But we got to continue to stretch ourselves. We got to continue to, you know, take the training that we had. You know, you spend a lot of money in school and on training courses and certifications. Those things are there for a reason. So keep stretching yourself. Don't let uh, that imposter in your brain tell you that you're not good enough. Yes, absolutely. I literally have a note over my desk at home that says, be Nisa, because I need a reminder sometimes. I had imposter syndrome. Of course I did. I totally in a new industry, new way of life, new path, new lingo, new everything. But meditation, mm. meditation really? All right. works for me. Try. Start with three minutes. Start with three minutes. Too active. Start with three. <laughs> <laughs> Start with three minutes. Do a little more, do a little more. Because what it does, it does. It helps you pause. You know, because I could be bringing some mess that ain't got nothing to do with work, but work about to get it, and I can't do that. <laughs> I have bills. So, like, knowing when to pause when agitated. Knowing what is this really? Am I getting enough sleep? Did I eat? Oh, wait, it's 2 o'clock, and I haven't even eaten lunch. But I'm about to go up in this meeting where, you know, it's really simple things like that. Take care of yourself. Believe in yourself. We all have imposter syndrome. Do not let anybody tell you that they didn't have a moment where they're like, nope, maybe not. I don't know. We're, we're the same. You know what I mean? I always talk about imposter syndrome because we don't talk about imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. And I think that is extremely important what everyone is saying here. But meditation, highly recommended. <laughs> I concur, actually, I know. They like to say that's not for black people, it absolutely is, okay. <laughs> so um, let's, just, let's just round this out. We will have q and I hope. I hope you all have questions uh, for us. But um, 
what are some things you should not do or that are not negative qualities that, that you should avoid? And, and we'll leave it you know, on a positive, but talking about something you should not do. Don't chew with your mouth open. I mean, that's basic. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to say one of the things that will certainly turn me off from working with someone or hiring them is being incredibly rigid. So rigid in my schedule has to be this. I need to make sure I, you know, am this level by this time in my career because everything is so fluid and flexible in consulting and we need to be able to work together. Being very rigid is always something that is very difficult to, uh, to deal with. Okay, so be flexible. I'm gonna flip everything you say, don't do them and say yeah. this is what you should do. So be flexible. I don't, so I think, and you'll find as you progress and work with other folks in your career, those who treat you in a transactional way mm. is an instant turnoff. Mm. And mm. then you turn around, you start treating them in a transactional way, and then what you end up doing is creating distance between you instead of building when you need to. So that's definitely something you should not do in the office. So invest in relationships. I absolutely say don't ever try to be somebody else. I can't be Trevor, I can't be Randy. I can learn from them. I can take attributes that I like from them. Let me hold that jacket then. <laughs> right, let me, let me get them that. shoes though. <laughs> but it's like, I, I suck at being anybody else. I'm a really great Nisa, you know? Don't try to be like anybody else. You may see something that you like in other people, because people see through that. They see what you're trying to be or you're trying to pretend, but they can see a person like, oh, that's who she is, or that's who he is. And I think I, it's like, it's clear as day now as a person who a little older, using that meditation, I realize, wow, it's so much easier if I just be myself. You know what I mean? God, dude, can you imagine if you fail pretending to be somebody else? Right. True. You know, let me take my failures or my successes and know that they're all mine and look myself in the mirror and say, you were you today. Yeah. <laughs> Hashtag be yourself at work. Thank right. you so much Thanks. to my panel. Yeah, no problem. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, so, so who's managing Q&A? Am I doing that? Do you? OK. No, so I'll be asking, asking the questions oh, nice. that I'm okay. getting. Yeah, oh, cool. yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Anthony Williams, volunteer Hi. for BYP Network. Um, so <clears throat> the first question was, do you think we have different version of ourselves and what version needs to show up at work? Do we have different versions of ourselves? Yes, all the time. There's church Randy, there's Sunday dinner Randy, there's Randy at work, there's gamer Randy, there's sneakerhead Randy. We adapt to the environments that we're in to be most successful. That's what we do, right? So do you have to be completely not yourself in order to fit into an environment? I really hope not, because you won't last there long. It'll be incredibly taxing um, and incredibly stressful. But figure out the spaces that you think you will thrive in most and just adapt to those. But we all have different versions of ourselves. And, and I'd say, that having different versions helps you to have a wider range of environments that you can flex in, right, and that you can excel in, right? Being able to tap into an understanding when you tap into different versions of yourself, different dimensions of yourself, um, you know, makes it so that there's not just one um, arena that you can play in. So that's important. Cool. I'll, I'll just ask one more question. Um, let's see here. It used to be club, Randy. <laughs> 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 so I have one here where, uh, let's see, there's a lot coming in. Whoa. Cool. So wh what tips do you have for changing your network to reflect the industry change you want to make in your career? Um, and this person is going from actuarial to data science. Yeah, do, do a loop at you guys, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that that sounds halfway related, right? You know, and so yeah. So so I think the first thing you do is look at the the intersections and the commonalities, right? And figure out how you can exploit that, right? Explore and then exploit. So explore the parts of what you're already doing that's interesting, uh, that is applicable to what you want to do, and be curious 
and start asking questions to those who are involved in the things that you want to want to get into. So that's the first thing I would say. I'm sure my colleagues would have more to add to that. Yeah, I mean, there's a great advantage right now. Like when I was coming up, I think we were just the beginnings of the internet. But like, if you want to find a group of data scientists, just go on LinkedIn. There's like probably 5,000 groups. And there's a local one. They probably have meetups. Go meet people. If you're within an organization where they have a data science department, go have lunch or take somebody out, have a coffee with them, and talk about it. But um, don't forget your alumni networks as well. That too, yes. you know. Cool. The next one is: Do you have advice for potential partners in consulting, getting new business, or selling and gaining leads, especially when not seen as a leader who can sell? Can you repeat that question? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I didn't understand that. Do you have advice for potential partners in consulting okay. where they're trying to, you know, they want to become a partner? Exactly, they want to become a partner. They want to, you know, um, they want to get new business and getting leads, especially when they're not seen as leaders at the organization. I mean, I would start with the not seen as leaders within the organization bit because that's most certainly going to be a barrier to entry for you. Um, and to me, I always said there's three basic things you always need to do in any social organization to be mm -hmm. successful. Number one, of course, you do your work with mastery, table stakes like we said earlier. Number two, you want to impress your manager's peers, right? Because the best feedback your manager can get about you comes from the people that she or he respects, and it'll reinforce your sort of uh, your brand value. The third thing you do, from my perspective, is you train your replacement and you bring the team with you. You pull your way to the top, not push your way to the top. And that will help you demonstrate the leadership qualities so that you're seen as a person who can, in fact, take that next step. So you have to do all that. There's one cheat code. No. You have to leverage your network, go figure out how you can sell a very, very big deal so that people now see you as a leader in the organization because you now have a substantial portion of business that needs to be managed so that you can show that you have those leadership qualities and that you're going to be able to do that year over year uh, as a partner in the organization. So no one's going to, they're not going to give it to you, you know. So go out there, leverage your network. You know, when I started my career, the people that are now MDs and banks and directors making decisions are the ones that were analysts and associates with me. And we're just friends. I'll call them and I'll say, hey, what are your problems? What's going on? And that's how I leverage and get new business. Um, it's based on those relationships I've developed over 20 years. Um, so use those to your advantage. Yep. Cool. Next question is, uh, what is more important, chasing new opportunities or staying at an organization to develop and capitalize on growing there? I'll start with that one. Um, I actually... There's a lot that I learned by being at Capco for five years now that I could have easily taken where my progression, because I was progressing, and then around like three years or so, I could have went somewhere else and you know maybe got the shoot up salary real quick and all that other stuff. But what it was the things that sort of aren't listed on the website or the things that nobody lists in the job description that I learned in the relationships that I built. Like if I would have left too soon, I wouldn't have met Trevor. You know, when Randy started, he was executive director, now Randy's a partner. Randy has seen me since I came into Capco and watched me and I've proven and impressed his peers, as he said. You know, so it was a lot of value in that and just sticking around. Now, of course, you know, some opportunities are too big to pass up, but if, you know, you sort of do your weight of, okay, what do I get here? All right, what can I get that could be more valuable staying here, you know? And it has been really valuable for me to build as opposed to just go into the next thing, you know? And it's not a fear of leaving sure for unsure. No, it's a real analysis. Like, you really think about it. Okay, I would be better off progressing here because I have, I have this, and I'm, I'm liking where this is going. You know what I'm saying? It's not like I feel dead in or that I'm hitting the ceiling. I'm liking where this is going. I seem to be progressing year by year by year. Let me see where this is going. So I think there is value in sticking around. Cool. So when you're not performing the way you, you want to be performing, um, how do you still show up and, and be motivated and, and get back to it? 
I mean, to me, it's kind of like what I was saying before. The reality is, um, well, I guess maybe there's a few things. First thing, I would probably try to diagnose the performance-related challenge. Is this something that I'm doing? Is it something about the organization? Is it the environment? Whatever the case may be. And, and you know, while I'm attempting and making sure that I'm focused on what I need to be, do to be successful, I also try to take some actionable steps to maybe fix those exogenous factors that I actually can't control. Um, but at the same time, I think, you know, there's a component of, a, there's an emotional component associated with that as well. So that, you know, I remember my grandma used to tell me, you know, happiness is a decision you make every day, right? Mm -hmm. And the reality is, if, if you haven't also addressed that part, all of your future efforts will be tainted along, you know, so all of your remediation steps will be tainted. So to me, it is a component of understanding your emotional state. And I know they say your 20s are your selfish years, so that this is the best time for you to kind of focus on that. Um, understand the environment, and then make sure you're using those things to, uh, you know, sort of triangulate on your own self-governance. I want to riff on that a little bit too. So I think it comes back to what you talked about is you know, the only, you know having mastery. But I think there is a, uh, a component of the dimensions of oneself, right, that we talked about earlier, and mastery of those dimensions. And they will shine, different dimensions will shine greater at certain times than, uh, than others, right? And so I think in terms of evaluating yourself and why one may not be shining in one dimension. Maybe you've been excelling in another dimension of yourself. So I think it is important to always look at yourself holistically. And in that evaluation, when you're ready to start shining again in your professional dimension, um, just celebrate what you have been doing well in other aspects of your life. Don't be down on yourself about it. It's all about whole growth and not just, uh, not just being one dimensional. Yeah, I got one other point on that. You know, as I went through my career, I had to learn how to become my own hype man, oh. like to hype myself back up when I'm down and things like that. But in those times when I, you know, originally wasn't my own hype man, look, I go to my mom and my mom knows nothing about finance. <laughs> but she would say, it's gonna be okay. You, you got through all this before, you'll figure it out. And like, all, that's all I needed in that to sort of keep going. But now, you know, I pop on the Two Chains Rick Ross playlist, <laughs> you know, get my motivation back, and then go into strategy mode like Trevor talked about. And uh, that gets you back on track. But figure it out what it is you need to do to hype yourself back up, and then get to work. Get to work. I like that. I would add one more thing, and this is actually equally important. Just remember that careers last a long time. Yes. Yeah. You got plenty of time to succeed. So don't put too much pressure on yourself.